So we've got Jen, have you seen or heard from Lynn recently? Uh, Lynn Fang, have you heard from Lynn at all recently? Who is that? Lynn uh, or yeah. Fang Lin, you say? Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, we just chart on the WeChart. When you okay. say, yeah, because, uh, because in China, so, so the national wise uh, conference is, right now is still hard. Mm. Very hard, you know, uh, particular, you know, on site. Yeah. 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 She she's doing great. I think uh, her used to do the just uh, become the, the national national one. Yeah, it's like that. I I, I heard some news. That's great news. Okay, I should email her. So give me a couple of minutes. Yeah, go ahead and we'll give it a couple of minutes. Kind of not quite Berkeley time, but something in between. To give people yeah. a chance. Okay. Yeah. So in Berkeley, even though if you say one o'clock seminar, they never start till 10 past. Oh, really? Um, and it's just called Berkeley time. <laughs> and my, my former colleague, Henrik, was Danish and I'm English, and we used to be like on the spot for everything. And it was always just us two. <laughs> I never got the hang of Berkeley time. Hey, yeah. Matt. Hello. Is that me? So I just want to get upstairs yeah. so I can clearly see the video. Can you hear us? I can hear you just fine. Yep. It's just I couldn't see one. There's no video for the uh, oh, participants. Okay. Yeah. Now, will that make it? Yeah. 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 Yes, I think that's what you mean. Yeah. But she should be able to see um, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's okay. Thanks for Yeah. yeah. Second screen down here, so you can answer. So, yeah, yeah it's slightly awkward there when you're presenting. Yeah, one more minute. Uh, so, uh, Jenny. Do you see the the right right screen? I mean, the dark screen or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put it presenter. Let's see. 
Is it? Yeah, that's perfect. That's okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, I want to welcome everyone today to the Wake Research Institute seminar series. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Gautian Lee from Hwazong Agriculture University. So, um, I'm very lucky. I used to, used to work with uh, Gautian at the Joint Bioenergy Institute in uh, California. Um, he started his research, his PhD was in Purdue working on um, rice blast fungus, Magnaporthia arising. Um, he then joined Professor Pam Ronald's lab at UC Davis, where I worked for a number of years on lots of different projects. So his specialty is really rice genomics and immunity, but he also worked on developing uh, new uh, biofuel crops, so engineering the plant cell wall for improved biomass in rice and switchgrass. He also helped develop Kitaki rice as a model for rice research, and that included developing a fast neutron population, mutant population with over 2,000 lines that were sequenced, which was a really, really huge undertaking. And so some of his engineered plants, including the switchgrass, are currently in field trials in California. Um, a couple of years ago, he started his own group uh, back in China. And today he's going to talk about some of his really exciting research using gene editing to develop um, some really fantastic rice resistant, uh, pathogen resistant lines. Take it away, go again. Oh, and I should say one thing is that unfortunately I had to leave early. I'm really sorry, go again. So Matt has very kindly volunteered to step up and post the questions at the end. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, okay, uh, thank you, Jenny, uh, for your uh, nice introduction. And also, I'm uh, very happy to present some of our research, research results from lab on rice uh, uh, immunity. As uh, Jenny just said, you know, I'm, my lab here is mainly focused on the rice immunity here. So, and then uh, this work is how we can use uh, genome editing to generate some uh, resistant genes or R genes in rice. So, uh, my talk basically covers three parts. As uh, Jenny mentioned, we generated a very large rice mutant population, and from that uh, mutant population, we identified this mutant that shows. Uh, uh, enhanced the rice immunity uh, against the multi-pathogens. And then uh, finally, I will present some data on the, how we can use uh, genome editing uh, to get some uh, optimal alleles for uh, on culture uh, uses. So rice, uh, probably as uh, most of you know, is an important uh, crop, uh, stable crop that uh, feeds uh, uh, more than half of the world's population. And uh, also, uh, it is an uh, important model grass, particular for the uh, uh, cereal crops like wheat, barley, and maize. And also, it's a model grass for the bioenergy crops. Uh, like in JV, we use uh, switch grass, and also sometimes we use miscanthus, and right now, probably the sorghum here. Uh, to do this research, definitely we want a rice that has a very short life cycle so we can do uh, the research in a fast way. So here we choose a, a rice variety named Kitaki. So Kitaki is a very uh, early foreign rice variety. It is originally from Northern Japan. And uh, you can see, uh, so I just said my, uh, uh, so, so you can see here, this is a Kitaki, and then it has mature seeds already compared to other variety, other variety even have not flowered yet. So, uh, so, so basically in the greenhouse, we can uh, grow this uh, rice variety for four generations in one year. So it is very efficient for genetic analysis. Then to use uh, this uh, rice uh, rice variety. Uh, so we uh, 
so we uh, whole genome sequenced uh, this uh, Kitaki and then assembled it in a high quality, make it uh, publicly, uh, publicly available uh, to users. So th this project is uh, uh, hosted uh, in the Phytozone, uh, which is uh, sponsored by the Department of Energy. We focus on uh, rice immunity. So uh, uh, we, how we can use this uh, Kitaki. So we generated a large uh, uh, mutant collection used uh, fast neutron irradiation. So basically that is a, a physical uh, uh, approach to, to do the mutagenesis. So from around like uh, 10,000 seeds, we finally got uh, you know, over 7,000 mutant lines. And then after that, actually we uh, used the whole genome sequence approach to profile all the mutations in this uh, mut uh, in this uh, mutant collections mutant collection. So actually, we find out the fast neutron uh, uh, irradiation actually can generate a, a variety of uh, 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 mutations, like uh, we we say it's SBS based that substitute single space and substitutions a bit like similar, similar to uh, SNPs and also deletions, insertions, uh, uh, inversion, translocation, and the tender duplications. So we map uh, all the mutations along the chromosome. You can see focus on the circle B, basically that is the mutation distribution along uh, the genome. You can see the genome, the, the mutations actually um, uh, distributed uh, evenly across the genome. So that is one thing, uh, one good thing about this uh, kind of a random mutagenesis. And uh, uh, at that time, we sequenced uh, um, around uh, 1,500 of the whole genome sequenced uh, uh, the mutant lines. And then these mutant lines uh, uh, cover about 6% of all the rice genes. Every right now, there are uh, many more uh, mutants uh, that have been sequenced should we cover uh, uh, many more uh, red genes in the mutant collection. So to to facilitate to facilitate the the, the uses, actually we uh, constructed uh, this uh, uh, online database. We name uh, database. Uh, uh, which is hosted at the UC Davis. You can see the database provides a lot of information here because it pro provides the sequence data, also the mutation data, and the seed information. Uh, so people actually can, uh, can uh, to order these seeds if they want to use in the basic research. Uh, in my lab in, uh, in China, I focus on the rice blast. Rice blast is a, a devastating uh, disease. It is a fungal disease, actually. You can Can we can't hear you at the moment. I think your internet might have issues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just for those attending, we're also having trouble seeing and hearing.
Just waiting for Putin to reconnect. Yeah, hopefully we'll be back soon. We'll be back in the Zoom. Yeah, yeah, he has problems accessing Zoom from China. So oh, he's got a student who has <laughs> been helping. Yes. So maybe the VPN was just shut down. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right, everyone, we'll give it five minutes and see how we go. It's just time to get in the thing. <laughs> Yeah, you were the slide before when it throws. Uh, uh, yeah. There's the let picture me. of the rice blast in the field. Yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me. You the right of screen? No. Uh, uh, let me, let you me. can see your desktop now. Uh, yeah, I see. Sorry. No worries. All good. Okay, how about right now? Yeah, that's okay. good. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's fine, don't worry. Yeah. And then you were on the previous slide when it cut out. Uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, here. So, I just uh, repeat a little bit. So, here in the middle. Uh, so, Jenny, please raise, uh, let me know when you cannot hear, uh, hear me, right? Hello, Jenny. Okay. It's all good now. It's all good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So here in the middle, after these accessible uh, rice varieties, uh, you can see here, basically, they are devastated by the fungal disease on the two sides after these uh, resistant rice varieties. So, so for, for, for the rice blast, uh, you know, actually genetic resistance is very important for disease control. And uh, so we think of different ways to clone uh, resistant genes, one resource, right source of the resistant genes are from the lesion mimic mutant. Lesion mimic, lesion mimic mutants uh, basically are, are mutants that uh, show spontaneous mutation even without uh, the challenge uh, from the passenger. So here we identify this mutant, uh, we name it the RBO1, basically that is resistance to blast. You can see here, actually, the, the, this mutant is resistant to the rice blast, which is caused by the fungus, Mycoposa oryzae, and also it is uh, resistant to bacterial blight caused by the bacteria Desmonas. So this, this mutant shows a uh, uh, broad spectrum disease resistant to bacteria and fungal diseases. So, you know, the re, uh, reactive uh, oxygen species is an important factor for the plant immunity. You can see here, when the, the plants are challenged with the chitin, that is one important component of the fungal passing, and then the, the mutant just uh, simply, uh, simply generates a much higher level of RS. And then these are uh, other control lines you can see. And th these RS, you can see here. And then during the infection, these RS just uh, restrict the fungal growth in the host. Uh, so actually, this green one, uh, this uh, green one shows the uh, high fee of a GLP tag the fungal fungal screen. So we use the whole genome sequencing approach to, uh, to, clone, the, to clone the gene. And uh, uh, with the whole genome sequencing data, we can easily clone the gene. So the target mutation, we say, uh, is a 20 BP deletion. And this 20 BP deletion is, uh, uh, is at exactly at one uh, exon intron junction, uh, junction site. And it results in a 19, 19 amino acid truncation. Uh, and then uh, you can see here. So confirm these results. Uh, actually, we did a uh, 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 genetic uh, complementation assays. Uh, you can see here the presence of the 
uh, RB1, basically the RB1 gene, basically that indicated by the three bands patterns, uh, rescue the lesion formation and phenotype, uh, confirm that RB1 is the targeted gene. So we analyze the mutation in detail. You can see here the truncation is at the C terminus of the protein. And the C terminus actually is a protein signature a motif of the enzyme. So the truncation likely causes a loss of function of the RB1. So So Jenny, still how it right now? Yeah, we can still see you. We just see, but we can't see your slides anymore. Can't see my slide. Let me. Uh, that's kind of weird stuff. Just reshare. Oh, uh, um, Uh, we so we analyze the mutation in detail, and then um, you can see here the mutation actually at the C terminus of the uh, of the protein, and then and then that uh, C terminus uh, is the signature motif of the of the protein. So basically likely, most likely the truncation actually causes a loss of function of the targeted uh, gene. So we, we analyze uh, the function of this gene, of the protein uh, use uh, is the complementation approach. So what we did here is we lock out the yeast uh, 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 endogenous gene, we say we named the CDS1, and then put a rice gene into the yeast mutant. You can see here on the YPGL, basically that is galactose, uh, uh, basically that is galactose catenin media, the yeast cell grow pretty well. And uh, so that means uh, 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 the rice gene is, is pressed. When we put the yeast cell on the YPD level, on one PD media, basically that is uh, when the rice gene cannot be expressed. So the yeast cell cannot grow. In the Western blotting, we find out that the rice RB1 protein actually can form a dimer in the yeast cell. You can see here, this is a dimer and this monomer. And then we use, we use the uh, lipidomics approach uh, to analyze the changes changes uh, in the E cell. You can see here in the, basically in the mutant line, we can see high, higher levels of PA and also lower level PI and the PG, or these um, uh, phospholipid uh, species. So we go ahead to, uh, to analyze the changes in the in rice. So, so basically here is kind of um, the phospholipid biosynthesis pathways. You can see here is the PA and then PA can, uh, uh, can, can be converted into DAG and also through uh, RB1, it can convert it into CDP DAG and also uh, uh, from where it can, uh, uh, can be converted into PG or PI or these PIPs. We see a PI, uh, PI3P, PIP2 on this side, the propagator PI3P. So in the rice, uh, in the rice mutant, it has very uh, similar changes to the E cell. So basically the P, PA at DG level are higher in the mutant than in the wild type. And the PI, the PG levels are reduced uh, significantly. Uh, so for this, uh, uh, because the PI, downstream PI are PIPs, uh, 
we so we did uh, some gen chemical. We try to do some chemical complementation uh, uh, for the mutant. So basically, we add a, a pi to the uh, media of the of the rice. I try to see whether the pi in the media can rescue the lesion uh, lesion formation phenotype. You can see here actually uh, the pi can rescue the lesion formation uh, phenotypes. So you can see here uh, the this these are the statistic analysis. Basically, as the level um, so only the high high level of PI can rescue the phenotype. Uh, so we go ahead to do the genetic uh, analysis. Basically, we uh, try to overexpress the PI uh, PI synthesis gene PIS in the mutant. You can see here actually overexpression of the PIS partially rescues the autoimmunity of the uh, of the mutant can the plants uh, grow much better and also the lesion just delayed also and the uh, the overexpression line become more susceptible to the fungal infection also we show here the some defense uh, marker genes uh, is expression are reduced a little bit but still higher than the wild type so uh, that's so basically confirm the PIS um, PI is important uh, for uh, for the thin type. Sorry, this is a very uh, busy slide uh, slide. And so basically, what we did here, we try to see um, in the planta, uh, uh, you know, the P, the phospholipid are very important on the membrane. So we try to use some of the biosensors to see the PIP, their localization in the mutant and also in the overexpression, a PIS overexpression line. Let's, let's focus on the, the mutant first. So you can see here, no matter for PI3P, uh, PI4P and PIP2, their membrane localization just become weaker in the mutant than in the wild type. Particularly, for the PIP2, their membrane localization nearly completely gone in the mutant. And also, these are the, uh, some of the statistical analysis data. And in the overexpression line, their localization are recovered to some extent. But, uh, but, uh, but they are, uh, but not completely. You can see here uh, from their levels, from their content level, the mutant, the overexpression line nearly uh, uh, rescued the, the level of the PIPs. So basically, we conclude that uh, membrane PIP are reduced in the mutant, and the overexpression of the PIS, the downstream OS PIS1, rescue, rescue the level of PIP but not their subcellular localization. As the PIP2 has the PI45P2 has the most dramatic change. So we focus on this one. So we use the biosensor uh, to generate a stable transgenic line. You can see here, this is the Y type. You can see uh, the PIP2 distribute evenly across the memory, but in the mutant, uh, there are just some uh, viscous. These viscous detach from the memory and start to go into the cytoplasm. Here, we just show some of the statistical analysis and then um, uh, confirm the results from these uh, fluorescence uh, signal uh, observations. So we, we focus uh, on the fungal infection. Uh, so uh, we, when we, we have the stable, we have the stable line. So we did it with during the fungal infection. Uh, let's focus up here a little bit. So these, the fungal structures, and they, this moment 
is the fungus try to evade from one cell to another. And this is just the, the tip of the infection hyphae. You can see here, basically the PIP2 quickly form a cap-like structures as the tip of the infectious hyphae. So that means it probably provides some protections for the fungus. And then as the, as the infection pro progress, you can see here, the, you can see here, first we focus on the EIHM, is basically that it is a extra invasive, invasive hyphae membrane. And then we use uh, the red, red color to label the fungus. You can see here, the, the PIP2 just the form seem to be uh, form a layer around the hyphae, basically uh, around the hyphae. It might pro, you know, provide some protection uh, functions for the fun fungal for the fungal infection. Actually, we did a little more uh, because that's uh, our focus of this uh, research. So we focus on the the big structure. Big structure is kind of a special infection structure. Its full name is bio, uh, biotrophic interfacial complex. This complex is critical for the effector secretion and the plant infection. So here we still use uh, the red, red color to label the fungal effector. You can see here uh, the red part is the, uh, the big structure. And then you can see the PIP2 just co-localize with some of the big structures. We are enlarged is like this. So here you can see this, the PIP2, this basically the fungal effector, uh, uh, effector viscose we see here. So probably from here, if you can see the fungal effector start to go into the rice cell. So from the, uh, the above results, we have some like, we build some model like this. Uh, so uh, th this is a fungal, uh, you know, the canidia, the spore, spore geminate uh, start to infect uh, the rice cell and they, they have a special structure with a big start to secrete uh, uh, fungal effector into the rice cell. This effector is uh, my uh, this effector is uh, uh, might play a role to suppress the uh, rice immunity, and then the the RB1 our gene uh, here, it uh, forms some like uh, PIPs uh, to protect the fungus, and then also we I have not talked about it, but we have data to show the PA uh, also important for the RS and the for rest immunity. And um, besides beside that, uh, there are probably other uh, factors uh, uh, that RB1 uh, can, uh, can use to evolve in rest immunity. So here we uh, try to present some, some like a mechanic, mechanics stick uh, uh, study uh, data to show how it works, but definitely there are lots of work to do. So with this mutant and with this gene, uh, uh, you can, I just say, uh, stated earlier, this mutant actually show very strong broader spectrum disease resistance, but, have, but it has a very bad, uh, you know, uh, agronomic traits here. You can see here, the seed setting is very bad. And also, you know, basically, the yield is very minimal in the mutant. So it's, it's, it's very hard to use this, uh, this gene uh, in the uh, rice breeding. And uh, so, you know, we, we take the take advantage of genome editing uh, approach. Uh, we try to use genome editing to optimize the allele. We use a two level multiplexing strategies. So basically, this uh, the guide RNA 
uh, that we possibly can design in the gene. So the two uh, level multiplexing strategy, on one level, we put a multiple guide RNA in one vector. And also the second level is for one transformation, uh, uh, e, uh, transformation event, we can put multiple uh, vector combinations uh, you know, to do the transformation. So finally, we got, uh, you know, probably over 100 uh, alleles. Most of um, them uh, are similar to the RB1, the mutant, they, this, they have very strong lesions. And, uh, but luckily, uh, for some of them, only a few of them uh, show very uh, little, very few or no lesion. So we focus on this one, uh, RBO12. So basically we name RBO12 because uh, it uh, has uh, uh, 12 base pair deletion uh, in the RBO1 gene. So this 12 BP deletion cause a uh, four amino acid uh, truncations in mutant. But this mutant, and plus this uh, edit line grew pretty well. So here you can see this uh, uh, seed setting is good and teeters peer plant is good. And also the yield most importantly is comparable to the wild type. So definitely uh, the line RB12 is uh, improved in plant growth. You know, as RB1, RB12 uh, has more seeds we can, uh, they also grow much better than the, the real RB01 mutant. So we actually did a, a detailed uh, you know, infection assays. So we focus on three pathogens. The first one is Respas fungus. We use the probably more than 10 uh, fungal strains here. All of them, you know, RB12 display uh, very reasonable uh, resistant to the uh, to the fungus, and also we did the uh, another fungus, the fourth smart fungus, and uh, with this one, it also display a very strong resistance. And importantly, in the RB1 line, the fungus uh, just uh, can only produce a much less uh, a toxin. Here, the same with bacteria passing it. Uh, Lesion length is significantly reduced. So the IBR12 displays a very strong broader spectrum disease resistance. So whether we can use it in the field. So we did multiple uh, field uh, studies. So here, uh, just to focus on here, in the normal field, after we did a multiple location, you can see here, basically though in those uh, in a uh, major uh, rice growing regions uh, in China. Uh, the yield in the normal field, that means uh, without uh, disease pressure, uh, the line, the RBR12 line uh, has comparable yield uh, to the wild type. In the disease, uh, disease uh, in the disease necessary or where disease uh, is happening uh, probably often, uh, so you can see here, this is the control line. So basically it's uh, uh, completely gone. Uh, you can see the plant is just withered already. And these are the RBO12 line to have um, reasonable uh, uh, yield. Here, we just have some statistical uh, data. You can see here the disease, disease severity is significantly reduced in the mutant in the RBO12 line, and also the yield also significantly increased. You can see here, uh, basically, this is the average seed uh, pure plant. Uh, you can hear the dramatic change uh, in these two lines. Uh, so, so that's uh, what we have uh, right now. So in summary uh, for this talk, uh, I have, uh, we have identified a mutant that can form broad spectrum disease resistance. And we 
use genome editing to optimize the allele. And we got a allele that still shows broad spectrum disease resistance, but without any uh, yield penalty. Your um, video is frozen on us. We can still see your screen okay, but we can't hear you. We can see your cursor moving on the screen, um, but yeah, the video has just dropped out and the audio, so we can't quite hear you. <coughs> So we can still yeah, just see if he... is that. So the 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 take home message is um you know probably we think of uh, um, the genome editing as a molecular scissors right. So most of us uh, think of this way. So basically the molecular scissors just cut the uh, uh, cut the gene and then we can do the functional analysis and we can use. Uh, uh, the genome editing in this way very efficiently and very easily. But as the uh, technology develops, actually we can right now use the technology as a, a molecular carving knife. So basically we can generate very sophisticated patterns or we can use it to optimize uh, the allele uh, fine tune gene functions, and also we can do some targeted, uh, uh, basically experimental evolution in plants. Uh, so with that, uh, I think that's all my message. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, um, you know, just uh, you know, just I'm very sorry for the the internet. No. No need to apologize. Thank you very much for a really interesting and uh, insightful presentation. Um, and I, I think well, there will be some questions. I think I would like to perhaps start, if I may, and it really relates to that last point that you actually raised. So you, you identified this quite strong allele in the original RBL mutant, which had a, uh, yeah. a very strong hypersensitive response potentially. and. Obviously, um, you know, you then went on to do the gene editing, but I'm just wondering about the decision to do the gene editing. Was it actually a targeted strategy where you said, right, this is, this is what I need to do, or was it just, we need to make new alleles, let's actually use that CRISPR to generate those new alleles? Well, that's a very good question. So uh, sometime, like, uh, you know, uh, accidentally, <laughs> because at the beginning, uh, our, our, our goal is to regenerate the phenotype, you know? Yeah. So in the mutant, uh, so the allele one exon is uh, deleted, you know, right? Yeah. So we try to uh, target uh, the two sides of that exon to regenerate the phenotype, but we uh, didn't succeed. Uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, I asked my students, you know what? You just try to, you know, uh, you know, try to just uh, as many targets you can, just uh, you know, just do crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's we we get we got all the different mutant lines, and then, well, the thing is, with all these more than one hundred mutant lines, you know, the ones with the strong, leash mimic phenotype, right? They 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 do not they do not have that many seeds. It's very hard to keep them. Yes. So yeah. So we have to go to the ones with minor phenotype, but have you know more seeds. So that's how we got there. Yeah. So, uh, that is the actually the actual story. <laughs> yeah. But I think I think that's really I appreciate your honesty, but it also reveals potentially something very interesting about the mechanism. Um, which you didn't quite address to the end, and I was I was wondering whether you'd go there. But does it mean that that RPL is acting 
in multiple pathways and you've just been able to regenerate kind of a, uh, I guess, a hypermorphic allele that compromises one pathway, or is it just a general slight reduction of activity that then is actually allowing you to see resistance and then the recovery of the yield components? Yeah, that's a very nice uh, question. Actually, um, during the paper revision, that's a major uh, question we want to address. Uh, but right now, we still have very limited data. We, 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 you know, I present the co-localization data. Yes. So, but the, the, for the mechanistic studies, um, we um, encounter some challenges because these, uh, you know, these phospholipids are very important. So in rice, uh, they just have a whole bunch of genes for each step. It make us, <laughs> it's very hard to draw a uh, very solid, uh, solid conclusion. But uh, right now, we only have like the co-localization data, you know, basically the cellular biological data to have. Maybe there are some clues there we can go further. Uh, yeah. yeah, so right now, that is uh, where we are right now. Because it was, it was interesting in your model, you actually had RPL almost as a diversion point. You had the phospholipid component and then you had the ROS component. Uh, which I guess it's hard to know whether they're one and the same or whether they're independent. And when, I suppose you could look at the, the weaker limbs and see whether um, the ROS levels are similarly increased or not and whether the, uh, the localization has changed. Yeah, the, we have some, uh, uh, have some data. The ROS is still higher in the, uh, in the RBR12 allele. Uh, um, yeah, but... Uh, but the localization uh, is very hard to say. Uh, so on the, you know, probably there is minor change, but you know, from our analysis, uh, we cannot see the 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 real difference there. So yeah. uh, because for this uh, phospholipid, uh, the transit, uh, you know, the transit uh, uh, changes in the memory or in the infection side, probably is the most uh, critical part yeah unfortunately that is just uh, is very hard to observe you know to qu quantify you know yeah that's it actually leads in very well to the online question which you may have already answered but um mia has asked the question can you comment on the effects of the 12 base pair deletion on the protein structure and or property or function i guess that relates to the rpl 12 um allele specifically yep. what you think that deletion might be doing. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, so we actually have done a lot on the IBO12. So we try to use the EAST complementation approach. Yeah. Uh, but you can, it simply cannot complement uh, the EAST mutant. We know that. And also we cross the IBR12 with the IBR1, the mutant, the, the strong mutant, right? Uh, it cannot uh, complement the original mutant. So uh. we, know, we know that. And then we use the, you know, the alpha fold to predict uh, the structure. And then we find out, um, you know, the four, uh, four amino acids, uh, 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 the four changed amino acids actually in one the alpha helix of the transmembrane alpha helix there. So that's the information we all have uh, right now. Uh, then, um, so basically it seemed to be um, it, um, the function of the rbo 12 is significantly uh, affected, but not as serious as the rb one the mutant. Yeah. Yeah, so we, and also very interesting the gene, the gene expression of rbo 12 just reduce a lot. So we, we have some hypotheses. Uh, you no, know, um, it uh, it may be, you know, on the, the that 12 BP is around some stable element for the mRNA stability. But all these we need to uh, study further. Excellent. So if, if anyone else has a question online, please raise it. Um, I've perhaps got one more question that I'd like to ask. 
have you looked at natural diversity in the RBL sequence across um, you know, the, the very many sequenced rice genotypes to see how variable the, the gene and the locus is? Yeah, very uh, excellent question. Uh, so we looked uh, at uh, the, um, the population. Uh, we try to find out uh, uh, try to find out a natural allele uh, that uh, affect its expression. Um, but we, we are in the middle of the process. We have not uh, got very nice results yet because uh, uh, in this case, uh, we have to go to the expression level, not just the, the genome level. On the genome level, there seem to be not that many, uh, uh, not that many uh, variations there. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good approach. If you can perhaps modify expression, it might be a target. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, so it looks like we're almost approaching uh, the, the finish time and I can't see any more questions online. Um, uh, Mia has uh, raised her hand. I'm not sure if we can hear you, Mia. If you have a question, could you please type it into the box? Um, Oh, here we go. She also, oh, it's the same question. Apologies, it's the um, previous question. So, um, thank you very much for taking the time to, to speak to us today, um, Guaitian. I think um, Jenny was very excited and we're very uh, thankful that you could spend the time to come and present. And I think for the people listening in, it's a, it's a very relevant topic. I think understanding that that Kitaki um, population is, is really intriguing and probably could lead to further um, insight for some of our projects, but also to see your use of CRISPR in a, a quite a different way to perhaps how we typically be using it is, is really nice to hear. So um, thank you very much for your time and, um, and hope the rest of the project keeps going well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you also. Thank you the audience. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank See you. you. Thank you. See you. Bye.